Well, good evening and welcome to the evening service here at Shenandoah Baptist Church. I'm glad to have you with us. I'm glad that uh, the members of F SBC are able to be with us as well, and I hope uh, that you're enjoying still our study through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter number 20 tonight. Acts chapter number 20, and we get to start uh, at the beginning of the chapter. We just closed off Acts chapter 19 last week, and we saw quite a few exciting events happen in Acts chapter number 19. Uh, we saw God bring many miracles through Paul. We saw uh, the baptism of some of John's disciples. We saw um, the, the salvation of some of John's disciples. Uh, also, uh, Apollos' disciples. Uh, we saw some uh, great confusion in times of trouble and trial uh, in, in the city of Ephesus as well. We saw uh, Demetrius, the silversmith, uh, stir up some trouble with some other tradesmen, and then it turned into a full-scale riot, and they grabbed a couple Christians and, and drug them in, dragged them into the theater, and uh, we're, we're going to build this thing up until probably those Christians would have been killed, but the, the, the riot itself was put down. Uh, we saw a, a deputy, uh, another official, uh, calm everybody down, a clerk, uh, come and calm everybody down and, and tell them that there are ways to handle this legally uh, and that them rioting and causing trouble was not going to handle the situation. Instead, it was only going to make things worse for them. Then... Um, Paul, of course, was being withheld from going. He wanted to go into this throng and try to uh, stop it, try to put it to rest. But uh, faithful men around him, other leaders there in Ephesus uh, who were friends with Paul, stopped him and said, no, don't go, don't go. Uh, boy, if you go and show your face in that crowd, uh, they're going to tear you apart. And so Paul stayed out. He, he listened uh, to his uh, friends, his advisors there. Uh, who wanted to keep him physically safe. And so Paul didn't throw himself purposefully there into the lion's den. And uh, we see now in chapter number 20 the results of what happened. So let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 1. It says, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him to the disciples and embraced them, and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts, he had given them much exhortation. He came into Greece, and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. Now let's pause here for a second. I want to think about a few things. Uh, really, I guess the title of uh, today's sermon is uh, Being Faithful to Continue. Being Faithful to Continue, and, and frankly, this could be the main theme of the book of Acts, even whether it's dealing with Paul or previous disciples like Peter, uh, can being faithful to continue, continuing to plod on, even in the midst of danger, even in the midst of struggles, to continue plodding on. Now, I don't remember this event very well. I was young. I'm sure I, I heard about it. I'm sure I saw it on the news uh, about the bombing of uh, the Marine barracks in Beirut. Uh, over 200 uh, American soldiers were killed uh, there when, that, when the barracks were bombed. And one of the uh, young men who was almost killed there in that bombing was in a hospital over in Frankfurt, Germany, where he was visited by uh, Commander, uh, Commandant Paul Kelly. And this young man, Jeff Nashton, although he was severely wounded and he did end up surviving, uh, <clears throat> wrote a brief note there to the commandant uh, as he came up to his bedside and he wrote a brief note in which many of us would recognize, Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, the Latin motto of the Marines, which means always faithful. And here this man who had given almost his life at the very last moment is, is letting his commander know what his feelings were, and probably the feelings of all the other Marines on that station, and probably the hearts of all the other Marines that gave their lives, will be faithful, will be faithful, even if it means to the death. Now, if, if a man, if we can feel that strongly about our nation, can feel that strongly about the desires and the cares for the American people, then what about a God who gave His only begotten Son to die for us? 
What about Jesus Christ, who, who literally came to this earth to be a sacrifice, to die a horrible death? Can we also look to Him and determine in our hearts to be always faithful? To be always faithful, it's not a very, it's not a very easy thing to accomplish. It can be difficult. There are many great easy times when we're up on the mountain, for, so to speak. Times where it's easy to serve, where it's easy to thank a faithful God who has provided for us, a faithful God who is giving us everything we want and everything's going well, but then when we suffer loss, it's a whole lot more difficult to be faithful then. Paul and the other disciples here are breathing a sigh of relief at the beginning of chapter number 20, and Paul yet again feels that it's necessary, and the Holy Spirit yet again has moved Paul to feel necessary uh, to, to step out of here. Uh, this, you know, there's a, a great problem arising in the city of Ephesus, and we can stay and continue to preach, and hey, by, you know what, the church stays, and hey, you know what, it continues uh, to spread the word of God. I'm sure people continue to get saved, get baptized, lives continue to get changed, but Paul, it was time for him to move on. I'm sure the disciples wanted him to move on. And he says he departed for Macedonia. He gone over into Macedonia and, and gave much uh, exhortation. He came into Greece and he stayed in Greece for three months. But even there, back in Greece, where he'd already seen so many issues in the past, the Jews wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. And so they were lying in wait for him. We see here the faithfulness of Paul. Again, look what Paul does. They lied in wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. Boy, I tell you what, we've talked about this many times before, about resistance, opposition, satanic resistance. And anything going forward for the Lord is going to meet adversity. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, verses 8 and 9, it says this, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. Paul's main enemy, it seems, was most often the Jews, which sadly, I, I, I could say ironically, was the group of people that he, he cared for the most, insomuch that he was willing to give up his own eternal security. If he could procure theirs, and that's quite a statement. But Paul understands a few things. He's immortal until God is ready to call him home. Nothing is going, to, is, is going to get in his way and stop him until God is ready to call him home. The question is not whether uh, Satan is going to continue to uh, be putting roadblocks in Paul's way. The question isn't whether, whether or not Satan is going to continue to try to stop or resist Paul. The question is whether or not Paul was going to remain faithful in the face of that resistance. And the question remains whether or not you and I are going to remain faithful in the face of opposition or resistance. Paul was faithful. And the Holy Spirit redirects, changes paths for Paul. He had directed Paul from Ephesus and now he's redirecting him from Europe back into Asia. It's interesting to note that Paul, during his missionary journeys, traveled over 12,000 miles. 12,000 miles, that's a lot to travel mostly by foot, some by ship. He evangelized, I've read, over 1,500 square miles during the 16 years that he was a missionary. And it seems that he was sick much of that time and needed to have Luke there, the doctor and assistant, to help him, to help him to stay faithful. Isn't that interesting that even though he was sick, even though uh, there was a thorn in his flesh, even though he needed Luke to continue to help him, Paul still remained faithful. And that's apart from the satanic opposition. That's apart from people trying to kill him, people lying in wait for him on a routine basis, people imprisoning him, beating him, stoning him on a regular basis. But on top of that, I see something else, that Paul here is accompanied by several people from his missionary journeys. Look what it says in verse number 4. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, 
and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. I see a faithfulness of men who are going along with him. But before we come to that portion of, this, of the message, I want to look at the faithfulness of the church itself. Look down. We'll read in verse number 6. It says, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Now look at verses 7 and 8. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. One of the things I see here again is the faithfulness of the church. We saw the faithfulness of Paul and we'll continue to see that. But now we see the faithfulness of this early church as well. They continued to assemble together. They are faithful to meet together. And again, notice it's on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Here, gathering upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Now, God is faithful to us. We're talking here about the faithfulness of man, but ultimately God is faithful to us, and he expects us to be faithful to him in return. Sometimes it can be so, it can be so very difficult for pastors to to almost have to strong arm some uh, church members or some uh, church attenders, I should say, uh, to be faithful, uh, to stick it out, uh, to come every single week or even more than that, to come every single service. Sometimes it can be like pulling teeth almost to get uh, some folks to come back on a Sunday night or to come for a, a weeknight Bible study or a weeknight revival service. And boy, to encourage people to remain faithful Sometimes we reward and coax church members into doing things that they didn't really want to do, but boy, if they were really had a heart of faithfulness to the Lord, they would naturally want to do. I'm not against giving reward uh, or rewarding someone for doing something that ultimately they should be doing anyways, like mem uh, memorizing Scripture. I'm not against rewarding children for memorizing Scripture, for church attendance, for bringing their Bibles, for in inviting friends. I think that kind of positive reinforcement is good to teach them that, yes, this is good. And sometimes getting them into the habit takes a little bit of help, uh, into the habit of doing good and recognizing uh, that they have accomplished something or done something great. But Ultimately, yes, we should do these things without any coercion. And the only service that really counts in God's eyes is faithful service, not mountaintop service, not service back in our youth times, not the service that we can look back and recall. No, it's faithful service. And what that means is today's service. We can all look back at things we've done in the past and say, hey, you know, look how great I was. Look at the things I did. Look at what I accomplished. Look how faithful I was. God, God must have been proud to have me in his service then. I used to feel that way about bus routes. Seems like the, the, the children's bus routes have, have gone. And so many churches, not all churches, many churches uh, still do have bus routes. But what's really gone are faithful stewards, faithful servants who are willing to go out throughout the week, who are willing to go out on Saturdays and visit each one of those families and remind those kids that tomorrow's Sunday and then to show up early on a Sunday morning, early enough to go get in that bus and go drive around and pick up all those kids, even early enough to go and wake some of those kids up and wait for them to get dressed and get them to church. It's not that kids won't come to church anymore, it's we just have fewer and fewer faithful servants willing to put out on themselves and go get them and bring them in. The only service that really counts is faithful service. And our faith really shows up in our faithfulness. We can't talk about our great faith if we cannot be faithful to the house of God. If we cannot be faithful to the face of God to speak to Him. If we cannot be faithful to the Word of God, how can we really talk about our great faithfulness? 
They were, not, they were faithful to gather together here. They were also faithful to worship. It was their custom. They broke bread together. This is more than just a meal. This is obviously referring to the Lord's Supper that talks, it's talked about in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And the point of this particular passage isn't so much the food that's on the table or the drink that's in the cup. And we can all argue endlessly about what kind of bread, uh, what kind of unleavened bread, how big it was, whether there was something to dip it in, the salt to dip it in. I mean, we can all argue about those things, but the fact is this. Jesus was taking what was already there on the table and he was saying, consider what you're eating. And I want you, as you gather together from this point on into the future, I want you to consider my sacrifice and think about it. Well, we, we do all kinds of things to help us to remember an event in our lives. Uh, I remember at the church that I grew up in in West Virginia, there's a, a stone out on the outside of the church close to where people pull in and park. And it's kind of a cornerstone, so to speak. Uh, and it's, it's to uh, be a remembrance uh, for anybody who walks by there that it is Christ that is the cornerstone. There's also a plaque there by the entryway. A plaque, uh, a bronze plaque, I believe it is, with the, the, the picture of the founding pastor and his wife and then some information about that to uh, recognize and honor them. We have memorials all over the place. I really enjoy Washington, D.C. Some people are think that's crazy. Why would you enjoy going into the city? I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, I really enjoy being in the country. But I do like going to D.C. And I like seeing the memorials. And again, what's the purpose of that? Is it to uh, keep sculptors in business? No. Is it to raise money for this or that? The purpose of a sculpture in this sense, the purpose of the memorial is to cause us to pause and think back and remember so that the sacrifices of those men and women are not in vain, so that their sacrifices are remembered and we don't fall into the same traps that cause them to have to sacrifice their lives. Churches have memorials as well. A place where we can go and stop and stand and recall. Back here on the hall in our church, there's a picture of uh, Pastor McCauley and his wife. And it's a, time, a place where we can look and where we can recall uh, many of the great things that he has done throughout his life. And we can uh, honor and respect him. There's a cemetery out here. And in the cemetery, obviously, there are stones. And on the stones, names and dates where we can go and we can recall and we can remember. And this is, in a sense, what uh, the Lord's Supper, what Jesus is doing here. He says, I want you to continue to do this as oft as ye meet, as oft as ye eat. Do it in remembrance of me. They were faithful to worship the Lord together. Worshiping isn't just throwing our hands in the air. Worshiping isn't just having this great feeling as we sing something in unison. Worship is done in many ways. To worship the Lord, and the Lord's Supper, I believe, is one of these ways in which we can worship the Lord. Not only were they faithful to assemble together and faithful to worship, but they were also faithful to preach. And this, again, is the ultimate, most important cornerstone of the church itself. Worshiping is good, and we need to have a heart of worship. Gathering ourselves together and showing up in church is good. But it goes beyond that. It's the preaching. And, and we see in churches today, in this time period, what do we see? We see the music service going by the wayside. Why? Well, mostly for legal reasons. <laughs> uh, because uh, in order to have a music service on the video, uh, you have to have licenses to be able to use certain music. And it can be a little bit more difficult, but and difficult to film, difficult to record so that it sounds decent. And that's why many churches, you know, song services are going by the wayside. And we enjoy music. And I know a lot of folks appreciated the, the Easter songs that we sang on Sunday morning, last Sunday morning. But ultimately, what are most churches doing? They're putting the preaching. They're videoing the preaching and putting that online because that's the important part. The preaching of the Word of God. This church, they met together and they asked Paul to preach to them. This service probably began sometime in the evening, but let's again read about this service. 
It says that Paul, preach, uh, Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. I know many sermons have uh, pointed out this fact before, so I won't belabor this point. But man, preaching till midnight, that can be a difficult thing to stay awake and listen to, especially if you're tired. Now consider Paul. He's packed, he's ready to go, he's been traveling, and in the morning he's going to take off and do some more traveling. And now he's preaching here for several hours. I don't know how many hours this is. But the point is, it's a long service, long preaching, the Bible calls it. He preaches until midnight, but the people are still faithful to stick around. Was there mumbling and complaining? I don't know. The Bible doesn't record that. It seems the people wanted to hear it. They were so zealous to hear the preaching of the Word of God that they were willing to sit there in that one place for so long. Maybe it was several sermons. Maybe there were breaks in the middle, bathroom and, and, and snack breaks in the middle so people could go and uh, stretch their legs a little bit before he came back and continued. I don't know. They were humans just like us. But they, they hungered for Paul's preaching. They hungered for the Word of God. I tell you, with, in today's age where church is done on our TV or on our computer or our phone, I tell you what, I, I miss nursery. <laughs> I do miss my nursery. It is impossible for us to sit and watch any preaching on, uh, on TV or computer with Carter in the room uh, because Carter won't be quiet long enough uh, for that to happen. It's hard to uh, wrestle the little ones to be quiet so that we can have a church time. And so what we've kind of had to start doing is doing it during nap time. Uh, and they can watch a children's service uh, later when they wake up, but at least we'll be able to sit there and listen to the preaching. Boy, sitting there and listening to the preaching on the TVs, is that's a little bit more difficult than it is sitting in the service. Can you imagine if I posted a video where I preached for four hours straight? I wonder how many people would last through those entire four hours. I wonder if I could even last through that entire four hours watching that. They were faithful to the preaching. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I've seen a lot of things recently about uh, on, on Facebook from seasoned pastors, so to speak, to new pastors. And one of the biggest things that they have tried to warn young pastors of is don't even try to please everybody in your church. Whether it's 20 people or 400, 700 people. I heard a story about a young man who became a pastor of a very large church. And after he was uh, instilled as the pastor, someone came up to them and uh, him and they said, I don't understand how you even dared to, uh, this, this, to uh, take on this task of pleasing 700 people. Uh, and his response was pretty much, I didn't come here to please 700 people. I came here to please only one person, God, and if I please Him, all will be well. And, you know, that speaks to me. I may not be the pastor of a church of 700 people, but the fact is, at times, even 15, 20 people are going to disagree. And uh, you can't please everybody, and all that I need to worry about is pleasing God, and all that you need to worry about is pleasing God with your life. First, or 2 Timothy 4.2, be instant in season. Or preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and in doctrine. This is a New Testament church. Do we want a New Testament church like this? A church that is faithful to assemble? A church that is faithful to worship? A church that is faithful to preach? that puts preaching first and foremost. I know the, the, the thing that most churches are doing now are shortening the messages, and I understand why, and I'm trying to do that myself. I keep setting a 15-minute time limit for myself for these sermons, and uh, it never happens. <laughs> it never happens. Uh, it takes a lot of um, space for videos like this on my computer. Uh, it takes a lot of space and a lot of time to edit them, to upload them. Uh, to, it, just, it really does take a lot of time. So the longer the service, the more time it takes. Do we want a New Testament church when things are back to normal? Do we want a New Testament church that cares so much about the preaching that we're willing to set aside our own personal comforts and time? 
We saw the faithfulness of Paul. We saw the faithfulness of the church. Now let's look at the faithfulness of God. Chapter 20, verse number 9. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And when Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he, was therefore, when, when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. God's faithfulness. Here to the Apostle Paul in one. Of course, we all know the story of Eutychus. Eutychus here dies during the preaching. Uh, the the pre preacher went on so long that he died. We've all seen those memes on Facebook probably where... Uh, you see, um, you know, me waiting on my wife outside Walmart, and there's a you know skeleton sitting there on the bench because she was gone for so long. Um, you know, Eutychus here waiting for Paul to finish preaching, falls asleep, falls out of the window, and according to the Bible, he dies. I believe that when Paul rushes down those stairs and he goes and he he tells the people of the church not to worry, not to trouble themselves, and he lays himself upon Eutychus. I believe that Paul expected a miracle to happen. He told them not to be troubled. Eutychus does get back up. They go back up, they, they eat, and they continue to talk till daybreak. This is all night long. When's the last time we stayed up all night long for any reason? Maybe it's because you couldn't sleep. You had nothing else better to do but stay up all night long. It could be very difficult. I like my sleep. I don't know anyone who doesn't like their sleep. But they enjoyed their fellowship. They enjoyed the preaching so much so that they stayed together all night long. And of course, having someone die and then raise up from the dead, I'm sure everybody was too excited uh, that they couldn't go to sleep. And they, they stayed around and they talked and they fellowshiped. And in some churches, man, as soon as that preacher says amen, it's close Bibles up and out. We're going home. We got things to do. Uh, and there's very little fellowship one with another. And it can be very sad. Uh, and I've been there too, times when I was like, hey, I'm just ready to go home. I'm ready to be away from people. Uh, I'm ready to just go and sit down and relax. Maybe it's been a long day, and I, I get that. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. I get that. But we should really enjoy fellowship one with another. We should enjoy fellowshipping with people at church more so than fellowshipping with people outside church. We saw God's faithfulness there in healing Eutychus. And God also provided co-laborers. Uh, Paul was determined um, that he was going to walk to the city of Asus. Uh, this is about 20 miles away. And others didn't want him to go by himself. And we, we read about this list of others and, uh, who sailed down to meet him there. And it's good for Paul here to not be alone in this ministry. Not only there were there others like Luke that typically traveled with him. But there were other, and there's the list that we mentioned there in verse number four. Uh, Sopater, uh, Aristarchus, Secondus, Gaius, Timotheus, Tychicus, Trophimus. They didn't want Paul to be alone, especially with people out there trying to hunt him down and kill him. And they didn't want him to be along. They wanted to be there to encourage and help and even protect him during this time. Co-laborers. It's a great thing. And when Paul... Some of these churches he's never going to see again. Many of these people he's never going to see again. And God was helping Paul to make sure that there was effective leadership there in those churches after he is gone to keep them from falling into um, compromise, do, uh, into doctrinal compromise, to keep them from falling into false doctrines. And here God blesses Paul with some faithful men. They're going to help him uh, carry on the ministry in the, these cities that he would not be able to visit again. Thank God that our friend who sticks closer than a brother is sticking with us too. Thank God that he is faithful to you and I as well. Thank God that he's more faithful to me than I am to him. And he's more faithful to you than you are to him. Thank God that he doesn't wake up someday and he's just not feeling it today. He's just not feeling church today. He's just not feeling worship today or preaching today or witnessing today. Thank God that He is faithful even when you and I 
are not. Over in 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 through 17, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Paul is pressing on. He's trying to get back to the city of Jerusalem, probably for Pentecost. He probably wanted to be there for the feast, for the anniversary of the church. But Paul understood that even though, even though he did have faithful men around him, at this point in time with Alexander the coppersmith, everybody else fled away. His friends, his helpers, and he was left alone. And Paul says, but the Lord, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And that's all you and I really need. At home, you might be here by yourself. You might be by yourself all the time right now. But the Lord stands with you. The Lord will back you. The Lord will encourage you. The Lord will help you. Will you spend time talking to Him and communing with Him during this time? And it's good to have faithful men around you to hold up your arms as they held up Moses' arms. It's good to also remember that God is faithful with you. We need people who will stand for truth, who will stand for right. We need people who are going to Follow God regardless of the consequences. We need people like Paul who are going to be faithful. But you don't have to be an Apostle Paul to be faithful. You can simply be a a Sopater. You can be a Tychicus. You can be a Timothy. You can be any one of these people who are faithful to stand with Paul. Who are faithful to the Lord regardless. And that should be us. Paul's faithfulness, the church's faithfulness and then the faithfulness of God in return. And you and I can count on that. So even now, when we can't gather together as a church, will you still remain faithful to God? Because if you're faithful to God, He will be faithful to you. In fact, frankly, God will be faithful to you regardless. But we know that if we reward Him, if we respect Him with our time, He will also respect us. If we um, are faithful to God with our time, Uh, He is going to reward that as He rewarded Paul and as He rewarded others throughout Scripture. I'm glad you took the time to go through some of the book of Acts with us. Let me encourage you to like the church Facebook page, to um, share uh, and subscribe to the YouTube page so that we can continue to spread the Word of God to others, to to your friends and others who um, maybe need to hear the messages from the Word of God or an encouragement or the gospel from the Word of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you once more for this opportunity. We thank you for the ability with technology to still be able to worship together, to be able to study your word together. I pray that you would take these messages and I pray that you would help them to multiply. Lord, not because of my words, Lord, but because of your words. And I pray that you would take these promises. I pray that your faithfulness would be be impressed upon us so greatly, Lord, that we would return that faithfulness in kind, easily, Lord, that we would return that faithfulness back to you without being pressured or pushed into it. Lord, I pray that you would help Shenandoah Baptist Church to be faithful to you, to be faithful to your word, to be faithful to your face, Lord, to be faithful to witness and care for the souls of others. And I pray that you would give us a good evening tonight and a good week, Lord. And we pray that you would help us to be able to gather together once more very soon. And we ask it all in your son's name, I pray. Amen.